Welcome, everybody, to the Kona Shane Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I am here with Dr. Jen Chatfield. She goes by Dr. Jen the Vet. She is a lecturer. She is a podcaster. She is a YouTuber. Uh, she has a show called uh, Chats with Chatfields. Uh, you can find it at chatfieldshow.com, things like that. Uh, she is doing a webinar for Vetfolio that I saw and thought was really interesting about leveraging AI to improve clinical outcomes. And so I want to bring her in and talk about that. We have an interesting conversation. It kind of goes all over the place. Uh, she defines AI very broadly. And so you'll hear her sort of talk about that. Mostly we end up getting into talking about things like radiographic interpretation, using AI, things like that, that are right around the corner, things that she, like she's already using in practice. And I just think that that's really interesting. So if, you, if you're interested in artificial intelligence and how it actually rubber is going to meet the road and what we're going to be seeing in practice as far as getting better patient outcomes. This is a really good episode. But anyway, it's, it's a fun conversation. I hope you guys will enjoy it. Let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Jen Chatfield. How are you? I, I'm fantastic, Andy. How are I'm you? Great. I uh, I'm so glad to have you here. I've already been enjoying talking with you because you do a lot of the weird things that I do. You have a, a YouTube show called uh, Chats with the Chatfields. I became aware of you not from Chats with the Chatfields, but because I saw uh, I saw a presentation you were doing through Vetfolio, and you were talking mm -hmm. about uh, using artificial intelligence to improve clinical outcomes. And I, yep. I sort of looked at it, and I looked at sort of the the the, the walk through the agenda, the points that you were making. And I was really impressed with how practical and sort of pragmatic your approach was when you were talking about something that, that tends to be a lot of hand waving right now. Like a lot of people are really excited about it, but, but you actually had insight uh, as far as use cases and, and, and ways that people could immediately pick this up and actually make their days better. And so I, that's what I wanted to bring you on today and sort of talk, to talk about. So can you open up for me just at a high level? Like, how do you look at artificial intelligence as a veterinarian? Like, what, what do you, what is your sort of larger picture philosophy? Is it, is it a tool? Is it something? Uh, is it, uh, is it a partner? Is it, what, what is it? What is it? Where are we going? Well, I, I, uh, I hate, I hate to disappoint listeners because that was like a super high level philosophical question. Right I, uh, there. That's kind of how I, I was go. very deep and intense and I'm not necessarily that person. <laughs> I, to be honest with you, I'm just trying if there, if there is any tool, piece of equipment, piece of information or philosophy that can help me, um, raise the standard of care that I'm able to provide. I'm, I'm for that. Um, and so I guess I kind of approach it like that. Like, how, how can I be a better vet? No, I like it. Um, well, I said, I, yeah. I, I kind mm -hmm. of did you wrong when I was like, oh, you, I'm interested in pragmatism. <laughs> Let's talk philosophy. And you were like, I'm not, didn't come here for that. I mean, I'm totally happy to rock <laughs> philosophical, like as, but as often as like the next, the next person. But, um, but I, I really appreciate data. And if I'm gonna, uh, if I'm gonna change something I'm doing, um, which I guess, I guess is one reason that I feel so lucky that I accidentally became a veterinarian, because if I'm going to change something I'm doing, then I want to either know that I'm changing it because I want to, or because I have data that supports that change. And for me, that is where um, a little bit of my fascination personally with artificial intelligence, with uh, the robots and the machines comes from is I, I don't know. Is it better? Is it worse? Is it the same? Um, and then from from that point, like we answer that, we say, oh, it's better. Well, then there's more questions. Well, what does better mean? Yeah. Right? How do you define better? And for me, overall, that's clinical outcome. Hands down, gotcha. clinical outcome. What we learn is the only reason to do a diagnostic test is if it's going to if the outcome is going to Change, right. If you're right? going to use the outcome. Yeah. No, I got, no, I, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, the, Not the, like as a medical looky-loo. Right. It was, it was always, <laughs> the, it's always that question of what are we going to do with this information? If the answer is yes. nothing, then are we, are, do we really need to run that test? Yes. I'm a hundred percent with that. Gotcha. Yeah. And so like, so that for me, that's the same thing with is whatever I'm doing, whether it be related to AI or not going to change what I'm doing with this patient. Right. 
Well, so, so, so start to lay it down for me. So, so what does that, what does that actually look like in practice? Because that's where, again, there's a lot of people who, who get really excited about AI. I'm mm. not, I'm not running into a whole lot of people who are like, this is what I do in practice. Uh, so, so start yeah. to, talk to me about that. There's a lot of, like you say, hand waving. Mm-hmm. People losing their ever loving minds talking about AI and are the machines going to take over um, and this and that. And, and while I do not currently live in fear mm-hmm. of the machine I'm talking into <laughs> right, right now, um, I do live in fear of taking the human component out of any sort of job that's focused on care. Yeah. Because you just can't convince me they can do it better. Right. Right. And so um, so I'm I'm fascinated by that interface and how we use it. So in regular practice, right, in a very sneaky way, <laughs> it's already there. OK, so I go into uh, an exam room. Dog is sick, vomiting and diarrhea. Right. Dr. Jen, the vet loves to see vomiting and diarrhea. And I say, you know what? Little fluffy white dog with like, you know, strawberry jam stool. Uh, I'm concerned that we have it's not called HGE anymore. Right. What do they call it? Like. ADS or AHD. It's got a new thing. Yeah, I, okay. I still call it HG. I, I'm, I'm old okay. school like that. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. So I say, I'm, I want to rule that out. Let's do some blood work. So I get some blood work and I'm going to run a CBC and I'm going to run a chemistry. So I put my CBC in the machine. I don't do a manual CBC. I don't do a manual differential. Do you? No. I mean, no. No. Not, hey, hey, neither does our doctor. Okay. So we put it in the machine and the machine kicks that out. That's AI. Hmm. That is AI because it's scanning, looking for cells approximately this size, this whatever, um, other characteristics. And then it's calling that a neutrophil and okay. kicking out a differential. Or it's calling that a red blood cell and kicking out, um, you know, PCV, plus or minus um, reticulocytes, right? Okay. That's AI. You're already using it, friends. You're already using AI. And then, I mean, obviously we have a chemistry going on, okay? Um, another way I think it sneaks in is when we run your analysis. So all of these tests that we use, like sort of bench top in clinic screening tests that we use that all rely on what I perceive as color. Mm-hmm. Urine dipstick, I'm looking at you, right? All these color changes, as a friend who's a hairstylist told me, everyone sees color differently, <laughs> okay? <laughs> So we're looking at this dipstick with like a bajillion colors. And I don't know about you, but I'm like, I'm holding it right here. And like I'm turning like the canister yeah. for the as the as the seconds tick by. And I'm like, nope, not that color. OK, maybe this color. maybe. That. Yeah. Hey, guess what? <laughs> we can we can. That is open for error with interpretation of the color changes. Yeah. So what do we do now? Yeah. Our dipstick well, we reader, have yeah. a system. Yeah. Yeah. And that removes that subjective interpretation error. And that's AI. OK. So another piece, this is my favorite piece um, because I am the fluids doctor. I am not the blood work doctor. Uh, I am not the x-ray doctor. No one has ever accused me of being a surgeon, right? Um, I love that we now have AI, sophisticated AI available on the market that will um, support interpretation of diagnostic images. Mm-hmm. X-rays. Yeah. X-rays. Love it. Love it. So, and that's probably the scariest one for people because we're accustomed to blood work, you know? Yeah. Um, just trust in that machine. And, but, but I mean, it's reading a picture. Yeah. It's reading a picture, Dr. Jen. What the, what the heck? Yeah. I, I, I think that stuff is super exciting. I think that stuff is really cool. I think, uh, I think it's going to open up doors for us to do ultrasounds and things like that in the clinic. And, you know, you'll, there will be, uh, there will be a referral of, part of it where you say, well, let's get a second pair of eyes on this, you know, and it will definitely be, uh, it's not something I would race to right away. I think there's gonna be a long learning curve, but I, I fully believe that we're going to be feeding our radiographs and then our ultrasounds and things like that into AI and just getting, getting our results right back. I mean, Dr. Andy, I'm already feeding my radiographs to AI. Yeah. Every radiograph. Interesting. Every radiograph. Yeah. Now, a better question is ask me why, how come? Okay, so yeah, tell me. <laughs> because the first question I had, I'm very, I'm naturally a skeptic. I mean, I'm Texan, mm-hmm. I'm naturally a skeptic. And so um, the first thing I was, I was like, oh, wonder how often it's wrong. Yeah, of course. <gasps> I wonder how often I'm wrong. 
<laughs> right? And so I wanted data because if I'm going to start um, adding this yeah. like component in, like what was the data? Set? Oh my gosh, that data is amazing. It's incredible. Okay, first of all, you have to accept that. Um, and and again, I'm I'm not like, banging on radiologists at all. Like I would love to have a radiologist in my pocket. Yeah, I just I would love it. Okay, um, I was not again not the X-ray doctor. Did not I did not like I don't like it. Okay, um, I like X-rays for counting puppies and kitties. Okay, right. <laughs> so um, it turns out that is part, partly because I'm human. So the diagnostic error rate for radiographic interpretation ranges anywhere from 30% to 65 or 70. Okay. So, okay. So let me give you a specific data, right? So on the, it's very different in human land because radiologists read like only one body cavity. That's all they do or one body part. Okay. Um, in vet med, we got to read it all, right? We right. take catagrams yeah. for heaven's sakes. Um, or at least I do. You can put your nose up in the air if you don't, but I do. Um, so if, if I'm looking at this x-ray, so they, there was a study that was published ah, it's fairly recently and they had four veterinarians. They had two that were boarded radiologists and they had two that were surgeons. I think that's fair. Okay. Surgeons probably look at, they look at tons of x-rays. Sure. And so they analyzed like how often they were accurate when they were looking at images to determine um, intervertebral disc disease. Right? Mm -hmm. Whether it was disc extrusion, protrusion, discosity, whatever. IV, DD. That's what they were looking at. And they were accurate 30% um, of the time. Hmm. Okay. Now, when they told them, like clinical context, then they bumped up their accuracy to, I think it was almost 60%. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. I think it's fair. Yeah. Okay. 30% with four people who are boarded specialists who like spend a lot of time in the, yeah, that's in the dark room. Or used to be in the dark room, I guess. I'm dating myself by saying that. But yeah, I'm like, well, what the, what chance does Dr. Jen the vet have? Yeah. Right? Okay. So it's tricky. And then if you look at the, the perceptual bias and the cognitive bias that's available <laughs> for our human minds. So they looked at human radiologists. And mammograms is where this was all pioneered because it's one of the most difficult tissues to image well uh -huh. and to a diagnostic standard, right? And so so they looked at this. Okay, they they discovered... They discovered that a conversation happening across the room while a human radiologist was looking at images, they're not in the conversation. Right. They're not even like consciously they're not listening. Yeah. It can impact it can impact their their diagnostic interpretation. I believe that. I mean, that totally makes sense. Like our, our, our minds are constantly picking up the things around us. And we even if we don't want to be influenced by them, we, we are. I, it's, I could 100 percent see uh, someone having a, um, a conversation about a different case and influencing what, yep. what you see as you look at this uh, radiograph. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, and OK, like I could nerd out with more. There's there's more data, but it just scares you. It just tells you like this crap shoot, right? So if you go to cut section imaging, this is one of my favorite things because I have a friend that's a human surgeon okay. and she just like, she won't, she's like, I need an MRI, right? For surgical plan, I need an MRI. I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. No problem. Yeah, that's basically a crap shoot with interpretation. <laughs> when you look at the error rates on interpretation of cut section imaging, mm -hmm. like CT and MRI, it is, you know, so if on the human side, for radiologists, if it's three to five percent on plain films, um, it goes up to thirty or forty percent on cut section imaging. So uh, again, um, when we get down to the practicality of it, you could flip a coin and you're fifty-fifty. Mm -hmm. You know. So anyway, so I'm very excited for AI. Now I don't always agree with it because again, it's the same thing as the, and that's this why this is why you can't replace the veterinarian, friends. Um, how often do you look at a patient and you get the blood work back and you say, yeah, no. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, that's, it's another maximum from vet school was first look at the patient, right? It was the whole like hammer on you that the most valuable diagnostic tool you have is your physical examination. And it's like putting your hands on the pet is the most valuable thing that you can have. I, I think that there's a lot of wisdom there. I look at that and I'll be like, I frequently like the, the technicians that work with me will, they know I say this. I'll be like, nope, nope, I don't want this blood work. Give me, give me a different one. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it's for that same patient, I'm like, no, 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 this is not, this is not it. Cause you know, the white count will be, you know, eight or 9,000. I'm looking at a dog that clearly I was expecting 
septic. Yeah. Right. Or, or uh, so it was going to be either through the roof or it was going to be in the basement, but it yeah. wasn't going to be right in the middle. Yeah. Right. And so and so I proceed with what I think. Right. OK. It's the same thing when I get this new fangled thing. Right. This uh, radiographic interpretation from um, from the robots, from the machine. And I look at it and say, yeah, I don't I, I don't think that's true. Yeah. No, no. I see this here. Right. That's, that's OK. And I tell clients that. Right. Because that's the hardest thing, too. It's like, how do you talk about that with the client? Right. Like I'm disagreeing with artificial intelligence. Yep. Yep. I am. Hey, guys, I just want to jump in here real quick with a nice little bit of CE love for you. That's right. On September the 5th at 4 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, I got a webinar that I am putting on. I'm not I am. I am hosting it for my good friend, Dr. Andrea Erickson. She is a uh, board certified veterinary cardiologist and she is doing a webinar called Cardalis, when to utilize RAS suppression and why. Guys, this is all about uh, the new drug Cardalis, which is out. Uh, if it's not in your practice yet, it, it will be. Um, this is talking about what Cardalis does, uh, which patients should be considered for it, and uh, and why suppression of the RAS system uh, should be utilized uh, in what cases. So anyway, that's it. It does have an hour of race CE uh, attached to it. It is going to be free for you guys. I'll put a link in the show notes, but come get some cardiology CE with me and my friend, Dr. Andrea Erickson. Guys, let's get back into this episode. Do you think that the, uh, that the rate of improvement is going to be pretty high. I mean, you think that you're going to continue to see these the uh, the number of times when we don't match up? Is that going to go down and down? Or is this going to be a constant thing? Do you think? I I don't I don't know. Mm. I'll t- I, like I, I don't know. Uh, I, I only know my own experience thus far, uh, which is it's not that often that I will disagree um, with the uh, artificial intelligence interpretation of the image. What it does for me, it's more sophisticated than that. It's not a right or wrong. It's the fact that the artificial intelligence looks at the entire image. Mm-hmm. And for me, when I have clinical context, because it doesn't care, it doesn't care that you're looking at a Frenchie. Right. Right. It doesn't care. Right. And that heart looks giant. And you're like, nah, I dismiss it. Because like, okay, one of the most common perceptual errors that we make in radiographic interpretation is decision, wrong decision, right? We search and we find it, mm-hmm. right? Or, or we, I'm sorry, we search, we don't find it. We we search and we see it, but we don't recognize it. And then the final thing is we search, we recognize it, we actively decide it's not abnormal, mm-hmm. right? Or or did we make the wrong decision? Like 60 to 80% are perceptual errors like that. And so, so if I'm looking at this and I look at a Frenchie, I'm like, oh God, that heart looks giant, looks super globoid, yeah. right? Like Alan Spear, if you're listening, globoid's a real word. Looks super globoid, um, but it's a Frenchie, so I'm sure it's fine, right? Like, that's wrong. And and my AI isn't doing that. Right. It doesn't know it's a Frenchie. It doesn't care. It's calculating a vertebral heart score yeah. um, and going to tell me what it is. And it's going to, you know, it, it, it doesn't care. So it finds things like that. And it actually helps me, at least in my experience, it'll help me with a more sophisticated interpretation in order to either more proactively encourage a visit today to mm-hmm. a neurologist, even though your dog's walking around. But, you know, we're all so strongly affected by our own personal experiences. You know, you have those cases and you say, oh, my God, I, you know, I, I did this or I, or I missed I, one time I missed this or. Yeah. And, and then um, and then you're looking for it, you know, and you have these everybody's yeah. got if you've been a vet for any time, you have your own biases. You've had you've had medications that you had a, had a side effect to. And yep, now yep. you're just like, I hate that medicine. And the truth is the data, yes. the, the data on that is great. Like the safety numbers are wonderful. But you had the one in, you know, a million side effect. And now you're never, you never want to do it again. Oh, and so please, like one of my favorite pathogens is leptospirosis, right? I go all around the world talking about leptospirosis and the metadata says that leptospirosis as a component of your vaccination is not, it doesn't say could be, is, is not a risk factor for adverse reaction. Yeah. Right. Millions and millions of doses and, and dogs, right. And, I still run into lots of veterinarians who are like, oh, yep. 
Yeah. I've seen it once, you know, yeah. it's, it's hard to get over. It I don't blame them. No, it's super scary. It's the, way, it's the way that we're made. You know, it's like when mm-hmm. something scary happens to you, you hold on to it. Like it's in, it's wired yep. into your, into your being that this is a thing that you're going to remember. And so it's, it's yeah. really hard, but that is the, the, the benefit of, of having, you know, AI or, or outside data that comes in when you can say, I have my biases. Mm-hmm. There, there are not, there are not biases here or they're not, they're not the same biases as the one I right. have. Right, exactly. So they're different, right? <laughs> they're not better or worse. They're different. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Jim, when you look into your crystal ball um, five years from now, how does it look different from today? Are, are we interacting with AI in a different way? Do you think it's going to be about the same? Like, what does is, what is practice look like? Just in five years is not a lot yeah. of time. This is a not, right around the corner. It's really not. Um, I, my hope is that we are. Because I feel like it's it um it's rapidly becoming such a powerful tool. Yeah. Um, but the difference will be whether or not uh you know when you grow up as a veterinarian you kind of you grew up in vet school, mm-hmm. um and you know whatever you learn in vet school is the way we do it. Yeah. Right? This is the way. That's your like your Mandalorian uh, experience yeah. is like this yeah. is the way, right? Um, and so I feel like if 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 vet schools don't begin to embrace some of these tools, then I, it'll be a harder struggle um, for the industry. But I think that they're becoming, they're so cost effective. Um, I do think they um, they enhance our ability to provide care at a level that now our clients are expecting. And so I think it, we're going to see more and more AI. I don't, I don't think in a, like, I don't think like in a rapid acceleration mm. that like, you know, I don't think it's going to, I don't even think it's going to even enter the realm of replacing a veterinarian, yeah. right? Like I can order a hamburger from like a kiosk and a screen, right? My expectation of that hamburger is a little different, <laughs> 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 you know, than if I, but I cannot hold my pet up to yeah. a camera and truly get that, that diagnosis in a sophisticated way. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we're going to be able to do that. Yeah, I love it. All right, Dr. Jen Chetfield, uh, Dr. Jen the vet, where can people find you online? Where they, where can they learn more about you? Well, thanks so much for asking. Um, and th- again, thank you for um, having me on your show. It's my first time on your show. It's been wonderful. If you if you can't find me on the internet, you're just not trying. Uh, you can find me at, at chatfieldshow.com. You can find me at drjenthevet.com. You can find me on the YouTube um, uh, almost anywhere. Um, and, and if you want to find me IRL, um, I'm usually, uh, speaking at whatever conference you're going to. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for tuning in today. Take care, everybody. And that's it. That's what I got for you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks to Jen for uh, coming in. Guys, if you enjoyed the episode, uh, let me know, uh, leave me an honest review wherever you get podcasts. That's, that's the nicest thing you can do. For me, um, it's how people find the show. That's it. So anyway, guys, be well. Take care of yourselves. I'll talk to you later on. Bye.